Yeah, I'm Emma. Uh, I'm from Dow, and I just want to mention that uh, I'm going to I'm going to be sharing with you uh, the results of my honors thesis that I defended back in August. So I've complete my completed my project now, um, and I did this project under the supervision of Drs. Amy Mui and Michelle Adams, both incredible professors at Dow. Uh, and I'll just get into it. Unless it's not going to work. It works. Not. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> All right, so you might be wondering why hydropower. Uh, and I find that a lot of people know that hydropower is a major contributor to Canada's energy generation, but few people know that it's actually a world leader in hydropower generation. So in 2020, 60.2% .2 of our total generation came from hydropower. Um, and that's, that's um, in total, that's not just renewable. So it's definitely a major player. Uh, and in the face of an ongoing climate crisis, um, hydropower seems like a generally good idea. Uh, it's low emitting, it's renewable, um, and uh, Canada has a massive potential for energy generation for it, uh, considering the large number of free flowing rivers that we have. Um, and uh, despite having over 15,000 dams across the country, a study in 2017 by Hoffner and Burpee shows that we have still dammed less than half of our total energy potential. So hydropower development actually started in Canada back in the 1800s, but from the very beginning, it involved the stealing of indigenous land and um, the large scale displacement of communities because of these uh, damming of sacred rivers. Um, and then the literature shows that indig indigenous people um, are not the only ones who are adversely impacted by this. Um, so this brings up a really important point uh, in my research known as environmental injustice, um, and then environmental racism, which is a uh, subcategory of environmental injustice. And I know that this is not a very well-known term. Um, I think it should be, but it's not. Uh, so I popped up a couple of definitions here in case you're interested in reading them. Um, so knowing that these patterns existed in our country, I wanted to develop a model to test if these relationships were spatially significant. So these are the research questions that I frame my thesis around. Um, so overall, I'm just looking at uh, marginalized community indication and environment, sorry, indigenous communities and testing to see if there is a spatial relationship between the location of them and then the location of dams across the country. So this is just a very, very broad overview of my methods. Obviously, it was a lot more complex than this, um, but I just wanted to go over a few key points um, to retain. So, uh, the first thing I want to mention is that I use only open source and fair use data as my data sources. Um, so I used uh, data from the World Dams database for my dam data and then census data uh, for my uh, demographic data. Um, and then the availability of my data actually uh, determined the scope of my research. So I only selected dams uh, to use that had hydropower as either a primary or secondary um, uh, use because you can have dams for a majority of different reasons. Um, and then I clipped that and then used census data that had um, like availabilities based on when the dam was constructed. So after all of that, I ended up with 16 models total to test and I detected geospatial significance in five of those. So uh, this is a map that I generated just to show you the general locations of each of the reservoirs and dams. Um, and you also might be wondering how I, um, accounted for marginalization, that's kind of a difficult thing to quantify, uh, but luckily something called the Canadian Marginalization Index exists, uh, which was created um, using census data for Canada, so it's a really great tool to use. Uh, and I ended up with four main um, indicators. So the first one was non-white population. Uh, second is population that owns their own home, and that's a really good proxy for income. Uh, population dependency ratio, so that's the number of dependents uh, per household, and then population with an education level lower than that of a high school graduate, and then finally Indigenous population as well. So this is a summary of all the dams that I was able to run in my analysis, and the ones that are highlighted in pink are the ones that dem demonstrated some kind of geospatial significance. And I just wanted to point out here that I was testing for those four variables of marginalization, um, and they were inconsistent throughout all of my models. So from this point, I was able to conclude that um, communities that had high indication of marginalization were not disproportionately selected for dam sites. So um, from here and moving along, I started to look at it with more of an indigenous lens. Uh, 
So you might have noticed that all five of my significant models um, are located in Quebec, and that's because Quebec is a hydroelectric powerhouse. And much of that is due to this one project that was conducted um, in the 70s. And it takes place in this census subdivision here, highlighted in green. I'll point it up on the screen so you guys can see it. Um, and uh, yeah, it's from this one massive project. And out of all the 16 models that I looked at, six had dams in just this one geographic area. So it is a massive, massive project. I think to understand the outputs of my analysis, it's important to give you um, the proper historical context of what was happening um, in the census subdivision that most of my models were found in. Um, so this is the James Bay project and the census subdivision that everything was found in is named Bay James after this project. Um, and it started construction in 1971 and didn't finish until 2011. So it's a 40 year project, it's absolutely massive. Um, and it spans all over um, the, uh, the northern area of Quebec. So right here is where you can see all the reservoirs and the dams. Um, so this project was originally proposed prior to 1971. Um, and it was at the time supposed to be the largest hydro development ever conducted in the world. So this was a massive hydro project. Um, so the project was, was approved and then in 1971 construction began. Um, however, <laughs> the construction began without ever consulting um, or even letting the Cree who lived in the area know that this project was happening. So constructors showed up and then the Cree had no idea that this project was even going to happen. And this was on their, um, their treaty lands. So uh, obviously this was a big problem. Um, they were unhappy about this. They took it to court. And then two years later in 1973, the judge actually ruled in the Cree's favor. Um, they, he said it was a very obvious infringement on the Cree rights and they, I, they um, order Hydro Quebec to stop uh, project activities right away. So that decision was unfortunately overturned just a week later in the course because they decided that the interests of the Southern community was more important and outweighed uh, the land rights of the Cree in the North. So um, this did not sit well with the Cree, obviously, and this dispute actually ended in the first ever um, comprehensive land claim agreement, which is a modern treaty. Um, and that's known as the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement. So the purpose of this was to amend a lot of the environmental damage that was supposed to happen in the original proposal, um, as well as give the Cree some exclusive rights to a lot of the land in the area that was originally supposed to be developed on. However, <laughs> um, Hydro Quebec right away just proceeded with their original um, plan and didn't amend to any, anything that was outlined in the agreement. Um, so this resulted in mass community displacement and um, just massive environmental destruction due to the flooding of the lands in the area. So this project uh, consisted of three main phases. Um, and the third phase, the Great Whale Project, was proposed in 1988. Uh, so since so much destruction had already happened by this point, um, obviously people who lived in this area were not pleased with this. And then finally, in 1994, the project development was ordered to be stopped um, because Hydro-Quebec obviously failed to uphold their end of the agreement. Um, they had also never conducted an environmental impact assessment for this project, which was one of the mandates um, outlined in the original agreement. So in, the, in 2002, the Pays des Braves was signed to amend for the original um, uh, agreement that was not upheld by Hydro-Quebec. Um, and then the project was allowed to continue after that until it was completed in 2011. So knowing that historical context, I want to go through the dams that had significance um, with that in mind. So La Forge 1, La Forge 2, and Rupert were all dams that were part of this James Bay project. Um, and La Forge 1 was part of phase one and uh, was very likely one of the first dams that had a major environmental impact. Um, so as you can see, um, it had a higher indigenous population and had mixed indicators of marginalization, which basically means some of the trends that I predicted were going in the, in the expected direction and some were not. So um, it's kind of mixed there. Uh, then La Forge 2, that was constructed only five years later, um, had a lower indigenous population. It was the only model that I had that had a consistent indication of marginalization in the area. So. There's a mouse over there. <laughs> I just ran out the door. <laughs> um, so what I presume happened here is that um, after the massive environmental destruction and displacement from the first one, indigenous people were forced to leave the area, which is why we're seeing a lower um, incidence of them 
there. Um, and also uh, the higher indication of marg marginalization is most likely because people who could afford to leave the area did so, and the people who could not were the ones left behind. So that's why we're seeing that there. Uh, the Rupert Dam in 2006 has a higher indigenous population. Uh, and this is most likely because uh, the Pays des was signed four years uh, prior to this. So it's likely that, indi that the indigenous people felt safer to start moving back into their original tra traditional lands. Um, and I just want to point out that this rise in population was extremely small, uh, and that's corroborated by these two graphs that I created here, just showing the change in population in this one census subdivision um, between 1991 and 2006, both general population and, ind and indigenous population. Um, so there is a very, very stark change even after the signing of the second agreement. So the other two dams were Denis Perron and Parabanca. They have a lower indigenous population and no indication of marginalization. But both of these dams were severely um, disadvantaged by the, the large number of non-response regions around um, their census subdivision that they uh, were located in. So in terms of Denis Perron, which is this map over here, um, this is where the dam is located. And you can see that 50% of the census subdivisions surrounding it um, are, have, are no, data, no data area. So um, for Parabanca, you can see that the dam lies, or the reservoir lies right here, and that's right on the cusp between two census subdivisions, and one of them has no data associated with it. So um, this brings me into um, a major hurdle that I had for my research, uh, which was uh, the lack of data availability. So originally I chose to use census data because it's notoriously the most statistically robust public, publicly available data set in Canada. So I really wasn't expecting to have um, data scarcity issues, which is what ended up happening. Um, so this ended up being a major hurdle to the research. Um, the data skips over the most active time of hydro development in Canada, and there's a lack of astute census data, especially for the years preceding 1981. So these were completely cut out of my analysis because there's no associated data. There's also several studies that show groups that are consistently underrepresented in census data, and unfortunately, Indigenous people are uh, one of these demographics. So this image here shows all the highlighted areas in Quebec um, are the ones that have no data associated with them. So it's pretty much the whole thing. Um, and generally, as a rule, the larger the census subdivision, uh, the more rural the population is. So you can see that as you move away from like that southern um, area where there's a lot of like really small areas, um, it, 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 you, you basically can't derive any information from that. Sorry. So although my results show that there's inconsistent patterns um, regarding this, um, the model that I compared to the historical significance shows that there's a lot more um, of a relationship here than just presence or absence of Indigenous and marginalized population. I also just want to point out that um, Indigenous land exceeds very far out of just where they currently live. Um, and it's very clear that in order to get a a uh, clearer picture of the, dem the demography of Canada, uh, we need to have a more um, put together picture of the data according to the census. Um, so that is the end of my presentation. This is uh, the main takeaway. Her is coming to us from Mount St. Vincent University. Courtney Strugnell is currently completing her honors research. So she's still in the thick of this research. And she is working with Dr. Merwas Kadri uh, in the Physiological Plant Ecology Lab. Um, she is passionate about investigating plants, climate change, and abiotic stress. And the talk that she'll be presenting today is looking at methane. Can a leading greenhouse gas uh, mitigate heat stress in plants? And so I'd like you to join me in welcoming her. All right, well, thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so my name, as you all know, is Courtney Strugnell. I'm currently an honors student in, in Dr. Mirwayas Kadri's Physiological Plant Ecology Lab. And I'm currently completing my honors project on the regulatory role of methane in canola. So I guess we'll get started. So the, the title of my talk is Methane, Can a Leading Greenhouse Gas Mitigate the Effects of Heat Stress in Plants? To start, I'll give you an outline of what I'll be talking about today. So we'll start with a background, and in that background, we'll first discuss uh, climate change and its relationship to plants. 
Then we'll talk about elevated temperature and heat stress. We'll give a brief overview as, of methane as a greenhouse gas, and then we'll move on to the relationship between methane and plants. So we'll delve into the history of that and some more recent discoveries which have led to my current study. We'll then get into the rationale, my hypothesis, and then we'll go through my experimental design, some key findings to date, a conclusion, and then some future perspectives. So to start with climate change, there are some biotic and abiotic aspects of climate change and they all influence plants, so living and non-living. Specifically plants, just like any other organism, must acclimate to their environments when they begin to change. And unlike animals, plants, because they are sessile, must often change their metabolism, physiology, and morphology in response to these factors. Of interest to our lab are abiotic factors of climate change. So those include elevated carbon dioxide, increased temperature, drought, and enhanced UVB radiation. Elevated temperature and heat stress are of interest to me in this study. And so the International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, are currently estimating that under high greenhouse gas scenarios, global temperatures could rise up to 5.67 degrees Celsius by 2100 from pre-industrial revolution temperatures. So this is extremely high. We are emitting a lot of greenhouse gases, specifically methane and carbon dioxide. And those elevated temperatures can be potentially damaging to plants, and those responses are registered as heat stress. The effects will vary by species, but some responses are generalized. Common effects of heat stress in crop plants, which are the subject of my research, include decreased yield, and that happens as a result of increased reactive oxygen species production, so ROS, and then decreased growth. To give a brief summary on methane, it is the second leading greenhouse gas after carbon dioxide, and it has a global warming potential almost 34 times higher than carbon dioxide. So what that means is that per unit of mass, um, methane is, is keeping and holding uh, 34 times the amount of heat that the same unit of mass for carbon dioxide will. This can and will damage the ozone layer. And we also say that methane-related anthropogenic emissions are especially linked to animal husbandry in the form of cattle and agriculture in the form of rice paddies. So now we get to the relationship between methane and plants. And this is a relatively new discovery, so the past 20 years. Frank Kepler first described in 2006 in his findings, which he published in the journal Nature, that plants were producing methane under aerobic conditions. This was a large source of debate. And for years, there was much debate about whether this was going to actually happen or if his results were a mistake. Um, further support for this came out from Paul Crookston, who is a well-renowned um, environmental scientist and atmospheric scientist. And he actually published his own research in support of Kepler's findings in 2006, later that year. But he originally found that methane was being emitted by plants in 1988. So these are old findings that he hadn't published until after Kepler did. Further research to support this even comes from my supervisor, Dr. Kadri, and this was in 2009 with his PhD supervisor. Um, generally, it is now understood that plants do produce methane when they are under stress conditions. However, we do not know how they do it. This is still being investigated. This is not currently the subject of my talk, but it's still something inter interesting to think about. Moving on to more recent discoveries about methane. Um, methane has now been investigated as a regulator of abiotic stress, and this has just happened very recently. Specifically, osmotic stress and heavy metal toxicity have been examined. Specifically, we are looking at um, aluminum, cadmium, and copper toxicity, and we're finding that generally methane is relieving the effects of oxidative damage that is occurring to the mitochondria in different electron transport chains inside of the plants. So this then brings me to the rationale for my study. So methane and its role in the regulation of heat stress has not been examined. However, we also know that heat stress can cause oxidative damage, which has been the subject of previous research related to methane as a regulator. So my new question became, can methane help to mitigate the effects of heat stress in plants? And specifically, what about in crop plants? Crops are directly related to human health, if we do not have improved crop health, we will not have great human health either, especially within a changing climate. 
So my hypothesis became, became sorry, that plants that are exposed to high temperature and methane will perform better than plants that are exposed to high temperature and no methane. Moving into my experimental design, as I've mentioned, I am using canola as my model plant and I'm using the cultivar 6056CR. I have two factors that I'm using to test this. One of them is temperature, the other one is methane. For each of those two factors, I have two levels. The for, for the uh, temperature regime, we have two different levels which include higher temperature, so 28 and 24 degrees Celsius. The higher temperature is what is observed during the day and at night we simulate a lower temperature as well to kind of simulate what the sun is doing generally. The lower temperature regime is 22 and 18 degrees Celsius. For methane, we have a without methane group and then we have one that's receiving methane and that concentration is 50 microliters per milliliter. So in total, that gives us four treatment groups. We have plants that are under lower temperature with no methane, lower temperature with methane, higher temperature without methane, and higher temperature with methane. To continue on my experimental design, I have nine plants assigned to each treatment. So that comes to a total of 36 plants per trial. These are grown under experimental conditions for 21 days. And the treatment groups that receive methane receive it every six days for a period of four hours. If we look to the picture I've included on the left, this is how I'm giving my plants methane. So this is a sealed chamber that I enclose my experimental methane plants inside. And then I seal it and I inject methane with a syringe with the appropriate concentration. Following the growth period, I then measure many plant traits. And so I've listed some of those below. So plant growth, biomass, growth index, photosynthesis, photosynthetic pigments, chlorophyll fluorescence, nitrogen balance index, anthocyanins, and chemical analysis. I've here also made a graphic to detail my experimental design. So we have our temperature regimes, and then we have the methane application as well, nine plants per treatment group, so total of 36 per trial. To date, because I'm still in the middle of completion of this, I've collected and analyzed one trial's worth of data. I now have two more that have finished their growth period yesterday. So I began plant measurements yesterday. Data analysis will come later as well. And another trial as well is in the middle of growing and will be done their growth the growth cycle next Wednesday on February 15th. From that first trial of data, I was able to find and analyze some significant results there. So we're going to start off with flavonoids. And flavonoids are plant secondary metabolites. And what that means is that uh, secondary metabolites are produced after primary metabolites. Primary metabolites are vital to human, or not to human, sorry, to plant growth, physiological processes, and metabolic processes. So without primary metabolites, the plant would die. So secondary metabolites are made after those requirements are met for the primary metabolites. Generally, what we see is that the more flavonoids that are contained within a plant, the healthier the plant is. This is because flavonoids are capable of withstanding stress, including enhanced UVB radiation and increased temperature. So if we look to the figure that I've created, um, each of these four bars corresponds to the plant that lies above it. So LTNM means low temperature and no methane. LTM is low temperature with methane, HTNM high temperature, no methane, and HTM is high temperature with methane. So what we're seeing here is that flavonoid content is decreasing when higher temperatures are observed. So that's significant. That's why there's the different lettering. However, when we give supplemental methane to these plants, we're finding that some of the flavonoid content is coming back up. So this is suggesting that um, methane is helping to increase the flavonoid content. And again, flavonoid content related to, to uh, plant health. If we look above at the, uh, at the plants that I've included picture of, pictures of, the one above the high temperature no methane group does not look as healthy as the high temperature methane plant. So we kind of saw that as well correlate within the physical appearance of the plants under the experimental groups. Moving on, I also wanted to talk about photochemical quenching. So photochemical quenching is a parameter of chlorophyll fluorescence. Chlorophyll fluorescence specifically measures complexes involved in the light dependent reactions of photosynthesis. It measures how that energy is going to be used and how it is allocated. 
So there are four parameters to that, which include maximum quantum yield of photosystem two, which is the main light harvesting complex in the chloroplast for photosynthesis. There's effective quantum yield of photosystem two. And then the two that we're concerned with for the rest of my talk are photochemical quenching and non-photochemical quenching. So photochemical quenching itself refers to the energy that's available to move electrons in the light-dependent reactions of photosynthesis, so along the electron transport chain associated with those light-dependent reactions. What we're seeing here is that photochemical quenching is high under our low-temperature no-methane group, and everything else saw a significant decrease in photochemical quenching. Normally what we say is that when photochemical quenching is high, we have a healthier plant. It's normally lowered under stress conditions. So this has been something to um, note with as a trend. It's that everything else is lowering it. No matter what sort of experimental treatment we're doing to it, photochemical quenching is coming down. To move on to non-photochemical quenching, this is another aspect of chlorophyll fluorescence. And this one specifically refers to the energy that's lost from the light-dependent reactions of photosynthesis as heat. And it becomes attributed to another uh, plant defense system called the xanthophyll cycle, which helps to remove the reactive oxygen species that are created under stress. We can't generalize the results from non-photochemical quenching like we can with photochemical quenching because they differ throughout the day. That's again related to the xanthophyll cycle. They, there's a different xanthophyll available at different light intensities, so it will change throughout the day depending on the intensity of the sun. We're observing, however, the same treatment as with the same, sorry, the same trend as with photochemical quenching. However, this isn't significant, so we're still seeing it decrease no matter what else we do to it. So it's something that we're going to keep in mind and keep investigating as well in the future. The conclusions that we can draw from the first trial, again, this is limited and subject to change as I still have other trials underway, is that methane is playing a role in the mitigation of heat stress, although that is not always significant. Particularly, our key finding, or our most key finding, is related to flavonoids. Flavonoids are incredibly important in plant health and incredibly important in the defense of uh, against abiotic stresses. So my current ongoing trials, to sort of test what's going to happen next is to look at modifying the frequency of delivery of methane to plants. So rather than delivering every six days like I did for this previous trial, I'm delivering it every three days instead. And we're hoping that delivering it more frequently will show um, a more significant mitigating effect of methane on these, on these plants. Other future perspectives to mention. So again, I already mentioned that I have further trials underway. I will have data collection and analysis done by the end of February, if all goes well. But I'm also working on a microscopy and staining technique with my supervisor, which we have improved over the course of the past uh, four months in the fall semester. What I'm trying to do here is to measure stomatal density so that we can see if there are anatomical changes to the plants, depending on the treatment group that they are assigned to. So the images on the left, the sort of bean-shaped structures are all stomata, which are where gas is exchanged in a plant. However, with the chlorophyll there, the green, it's difficult to read how many stomata are truly there. So instead, what we've been trying to do is to clear the plants of any chlorophyll and then stain it to try to see if we can identify the stomata more clearly. So the two images on the right have been two attempts at clearing the chlorophyll. The one in the middle uses ethanol, and so we use a very concentrated ethanol to clear chlorophyll for three days, and then we stained with safranin. So this is at the 100 times magnification for that image. We still can't tell all of the stomata very clearly, so we're going to work on modifying that further. The one on the right used DMSO, which is another nonpolar, very strong solvent. It also cleared the chlorophyll, was not incredibly successful though, so we are again going to look at further modifying this procedure. And that's something that I hope to include in my thesis when it is, when I finish writing it. Beyond that, that is the rest of my talk and I'm happy to welcome any quick questions. Last but not least, for our final talk today, Brittany Rowan from St. Mary's University will be discussing the ebb and flow of blue carbon in the Bay of Fundy salt marshes. And this is some work that Brittany is completing for her PhD in Dr. Danica von Proustie's lab in the Department of Geography.
in collaboration with your co-supervisor, Dr. Lisa Kelman in the Department of Earth Sciences at St. Francis Xavier University. Uh, and this is part of a larger research project at an NSERC ResNet strategic network. And this group is monitoring, modeling, and managing Canadian ecosystem services uh, to improve sustainability and resilience. And in particular, the work here at St. Mary's is focusing on salt marshes. And Brittany will tell you a little bit more about this today. So join me in welcoming her. Here's a mouse out for you. So it's, yeah, you can see it, You're great. Okay, great. Well, thank you for the introduction and thanks for joining me tonight. I'm gonna to be talking to you about my talk, The Ebb and Flow of Blue Carbon in the Bay of Fundy Salt Marshes. So first, what is blue carbon? So blue carbon is a term that's used to describe the carbon storage ecosystem service of coastal wetlands. So these are things like salt marshes, mangroves, and seagrass meadows. And these ecosystems are known for storing carbon for a few reasons. Uh, first, they're very highly productive ecosystems. So they take in CO2 from the atmosphere, they store it in their living biomass, and that eventually gets stored in the soil, seen here with these blue circles, as non-living biomass. And it's also, they experience little competition because they're salt tolerant species, so they can really grow quite vigorously. Second, because they're coastal wetlands, there are slow decomposition rates because they're generally flooded. Uh, thirdly, they also act as, receiving, as a receiving ground for external sediments, so sediments from other ecosystems as well. And finally, they don't seem to become saturated with carbon through time uh, as they continually accrete with sea level rise. And so how much blue carbon is there exactly? Uh, so this figure and this table are from a review by, uh, done in 2020 that looks at the amount of carbon stock in salt marshes and mangrove forests. And so carbon stock really just represents how much carbon is in, is in an ecosystem and that could be lost if the ecosystem was degraded or lost. So carbon stock is often represented by the amount of carbon per an area. So the average, oh, and also in salt marshes, 95% of the carbon stock is in the soils, and that's different than a mangrove because they aren't trees. Um, so on average, the total carbon stock in salt marshes globally is about 334 megagrams of carbon per hectare. So if you scale that up to the global extent of salt marshes globally, which is about 55,000 kilometers squared, you get about 1.84 um, petagrams of carbon globally stored in salt marsh soils. And so that's a lot of carbon. Uh, there's a number here for you to review. <laughs> but you might be saying, well, forest soils, terrestrial forest soils store a lot, and they do, 862 petagrams glo globally, which is quite a lot. However, you have to keep in mind that the global uh, area of forest is about 800 times that of salt marshes. And so on a per area basis, actually salt marshes store more carbon per, per area than forest soils. So forest soils, terrestrial forest soils, only store about 60% of the carbon as at least salt marshes and probably less than mangroves, as you can see here. So carbon stock differs from carbon accumulation. So carbon accumulation in an ecosystem is how much new carbon is added every year. And carbon accumulation is the combination of, of two sources. So first we have alloxanous carbon, which I also like to call come from away carbon. So that's the carbon <laughs> that's from other ecosystems, like marine systems or terrestrial systems. So it comes into the wetland, it gets trapped in the vegetation, and it settles. Um, this differs from autochthonous carbon, and so that's really the vegetation actually growing in the coastal wetland, um, taking the CO2 in again through, the, through photosynthesis, storing it, in the, storing it in the soils. And so this is really sequestration. So you need to keep in mind that the accumulation of carbon in an ecosystem is really the sum of both alloxanous and autochthonous carbon. And a lot of people use sequestration in interchangeably with accumulation, but it is, it is just a different term to keep straight. So another thing that I'm focusing in on my research is, is also the preservation of blue carbon. So generally it's accepted now that ecosystem properties, uh, rather than just the chemical composition of carbon itself, actually control rates of decomposition. So this figure, there's a lot going on, but it's essentially a review of different ecosystem properties that are controlling how carbon is uh, preserved in coastal wetlands. And through review of this paper and also others, I've kind of divided them into two main categories myself. So first, 
They're the environmental conditions. So these are things that influence microbial, microbial activity and presence. So things like oxygen, pH, interaction with plants. And then the second category, main category are physiochemical protection. So these are things that actually just make carbon inaccessible to microbes. So they can't even break it down and munch on it in the first place. Um, and so the other thing to keep in mind about blue carbon ecosystems is although they store a lot of carbon, they're also dynamic ecosystems. So they're sites of rapid carbon cycling. So because of these conditions, they're known to produce greenhouse gases. So as I've said before, carbon dioxide is taken up by plants through photosynthesis, but it's also released through respiration, plant respiration, uh, and decomposition of organic matter. But in salt marshes, there's usually a net uptake um, the soil carbon pool grows, it stays there because of those flooded conditions, and there's actually a net cooling effect, as you can see with that blue arrow. Sorry, I'm pointing at the screen for the people online, the blue arrow here. Um, but those flooded conditions, low anoxic condition, low oxygen conditions, are also um, favorable for the production of greenhouse gases. So Courtney went ahead and explained a little bit about methane, which is great. Um, and so it is usually produced in these systems. Um, sorry, in low oxygen systems, but in polyhaline marshes, which means there's lots of salt water, it's generally considered to be low. And this is because there's lots of other terminal electron acceptors in seawater. So essentially, methanogens just get outcompeted by other um, microbial communities, and methane never really gets a chance to be produced, which is like, generally accepted. Um, however, it's really important to measure methane still because it has a sustained flux global warming potential, which is a bit different than just the global warming potential. That's 45 times that of CO2. So essentially you need to sequester 45 kilos of CO2 to offset one kilo of methane being emitted. And so it's important to keep in mind that if you drain a salt marsh or you actually um, restrict tidal flow that you can increase uh, CO2 flux or methane flux, which can increase the climate forcing or, or provide a net warming effect. And so this is radiative forcing or climatic forcing that's shown here in these arrows. And that's just affected by the radiative balance. And that's essentially just a measure of whether an ecosystem is a net source or sink of greenhouse gases. So unfortunately, over the last century, about 25 to 50% of coastal wetlands have been lost. And salt marshes are particularly at risk because they are located in the temperate zone where most of the global population resides. And so because of their ability to store a lot more carbon per, per area, as discussed earlier, compared to forest soils, there's a lot of interest in restoring these to act as blue carbon sinks or carbon storage sinks. And one way to restore a salt marsh is through managed realignment. And that's something that's happening in the Bay of Fundy. And I'll get more into that in a minute. So essentially, you have a, a system that's diked. You can then remove that earthen barrier. Uh, tidal water is can return. Uh, sedimentation occurs and a salt marsh will eventually restore itself. And so in the Bay of Fundy, there was a managed realignment done in 2010. And this paper looks at how, 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 how the carbon accumulation, uh, carbon accumulation rate differed between that managed realignment site and natural marshes. And what they found is that, you know, the carbon accumulation rate was five times larger than natural marshes in the region, which is very, quite, quite a difference. And so this is a very similar finding to a managed realignment site in England, which again also showed that in the short term, that carbon accumulation rate in these restored sites was significantly higher than in the natural marshes of the region. And so there's a lot of excitement about using managed realignment and restored marshes as a, a, a tool for mitigating climate change, as you can see here with this, um, this headline. <laughs> but the authors of both of these papers that report on this do indicate that most of that carbon accumulating is of a lochthinous nature. And really research shows that in the short term, at least when you restore coastal wetland, most of that carbon is of a lochthinous nature. And so why does this matter? Um, so verify, uh, so global carbon, global voluntary carbon crediting methodologies like the verified carbon standard, they actually will um, um, give you a deduction to your carbon credits based on the amount of allochthonous carbon in your project, basically because they do not want to double count carbon credits that might already be attributed to a neighboring ecosystem. Further, for these uh, carbon crediting systems, residence time of carbon is really important 
because climate needs to be uh, climate carbon needs to be stored over the long time periods to provide any climatic benefit. And then finally, also a lot of these um, carbon crediting methodologies require you to monitor greenhouse gas emissions because we want to make sure that any benefit uh, in reduction of greenhouse gases is uh, not outweighed by emissions. So you have more reduction than emission. You have a net uptake. So this leads to my research question in my PhD, and it is what is the blue carbon potential of salt marshes restored by a managed realignment in the upper Bay of Fundy? And I have three main objectives. I'm not going to get really into the details of them. I'm going to instead show you lots of pictures. Uh, so they are characterize and quantify sources of blue carbon in the system, identify the dominant mechanisms driving the preservation of blue carbon, and quantify losses, both gaseous and dissolved, of blue carbon. So my study area, like I said, is the Upper Bay of Fundy, which is located at the border of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. And these provinces have about 20% of Canada's total salt marsh habitat. It's actually thought that about 80% of the historical salt marsh habitat in the Bay of Fundy region, kind of shown here, was lost due to extensive diking by European settlers. So this just shows the existing Nova Scotia dikelands that still exist. And so there's actually ample opportunity for managed realignment and restoration of salt marshes in this region, because a lot of these dikes, not all of them, but a good portion of them are expensive to maintain because of erosion and sea level rise, um, et cetera. So the opportunity exists here. So my study sites, I actually have four study sites that I worked on this summer, and they represent a chrono sequence, or three of them represent a chrono sequence, and then I have a natural marsh. So my first one is the Converse site, which was breached um, in 2018, so it's about four years old. The second site I'm working in is the same one, that OLAC site that I talked about earlier, that talked about the carbon accumulation rate, so that's about 12 years old now. Um, then I am working in the John Lesby National Wildlife Area, which actually was basically allowed to passively restore itself after World War II because they just couldn't maintain the dikes and they just basically let it go back to nature. Um, and finally, I have a natural marsh as a reference, so the Wood Point Rest Stop. And so I'm not going to go into super uh, detail about my methods I use. You can ask me about it. I'm just going to show you some photos about what I did last summer. Um, and yeah, so essentially the first thing we did in June of 2022, we collected 36 sediment cores. So we used a gouge core. You can see here I'm holding that. It's about 50 centimeters of, of sediment. And I had to shave them down because they didn't fit when they came out. They were too fat. So that was a fun activity. And then we would conduct a, vege a vegetation survey where we got the core. And then also I went back in August and September and, um, and collected deposited sediment samples. So I'm, I'm doing this mostly for my objective one to figure out the source of carbon, but also objective two to figure out what, is there anything in that soil that's preserving it? And so this past fall, I actually did a bunch of lab work to figure out, to kind of get a sense of how much carbon is in those cores. So first I did bulk density, and then I worked on loss and ignition. So bulk density is just the amount of dry soil per known volume. So the lower the bulk density, the higher the porosity, the higher the um, water holding capacity. So the spongier it is usually. So what you do is you have your known volume, which is this my little cylinder here that I, I used. Um, I also divided the core into 10 five centimeter increments. So 10 per core. So I had 360 sediment samples to do this with. Um, so I dried them in an oven, and then you have your dry weight. And so once I had my dry weight, so that you have bulk density, that's great. So then once you have your dry weight, you can grind it up, and then you put it in a muffle furnace, and you bake it for 500, sorry, at four, you know, 550 degrees Celsius for four hours, and you figure out how much mass was lost, so loss and ignition. So you weigh it before and after, and so once you know how much you've lost, that's basically how much organic matter is in the sample. And you can convert percent organic matter to percent carbon using conversion equations. And then you multiply percent carbon by bulk density, and then you know how much carbon's in your core. Just give or take, give or take. Um, so then in July, back to the field work. Um, in July, I also went and installed piezometers and water level recorders. So it was, uh, piezometers are basically kind of like groundwater wells, and there's like slots at the bottom so you can uh, figure out how the water's moving below the marsh surface. So we installed about 20, not quite 24, in two of the marshes. We had a lot of fun. Sometimes it was very mucky, as you can see on the top right. Um, I also installed some water level recorders in the four marshes just to track tidal water levels. 
And that's mainly because there isn't actually a tidal station in the upper Bay of Fundy, it's just predicted tides. So I really wanna figure out, and this is a lot of to do with objective two, like figuring out what's protecting that carbon, what's preserving the carbon. And you also see some of the marsh math I had to do on the fly. So. <coughs> And so finally, I also did greenhouse gas measurements in August. So I was able to borrow some equipment from EOSense, a company in Dartmouth, and also a um, ultra portable greenhouse gas analyzer from the Flux Lab at Santa Fe. And so I borrowed the big, large transparent chamber. And also I had a smaller, just auto chamber. And I measured simultaneously CO2 and methane. So there actually hasn't been any greenhouse gas measurements done in the Bay of Fundy and restored salt marshes. Um, there's only been a few greenhouse gas studies done in salt marshes, but it's really in the outer bay, not the upper bay. And so this just shows you essentially a typical, this is the user interface that you can see of the, the greenhouse gas analyzer. So this is just a typical methane flux. You can see it's pretty low. You can see the concentration on the side, but it's still a steady flux. And then the one on the bottom shows you what a typical uptake curve would be. So this is what would be happening under the transparent chamber, kind of representing what's happening with photosynthesis. So what is the significance of the re research? Why am I even doing this? So in a, uh, and at COP26 in 2021, 153 countries put forward new or updated emissions reduction targets to meet net zero by 2050. So in June of 2021, Canada's target became law. And in March of 2022, they actually reduced their 2030 emissions reduction plan. And in it, they have many, many tools that they're going to be using to meet net zero, one of them being these nature-based solutions. And these are things like conserving, restoring, and enhancing ecosystems, essentially, that store and capture carbon. However, the use of any ecosystem, blue carbon ecosystems included, to meet climate goals really um, requires significant investment in research, data collection, and model verification. So I'm just hoping that my study will provide kind of a first step at lo providing local baseline blue carbon data so that we can actually assess whether using blue carbon to meet net zero climate goals is even a viable solution in our country and region. So quickly, I just wanna really thank all my research assistants. They, without them, I would not have been able to get as much work done as I did. Also my funders, uh, the EOSUNS and Flex Lab, and then my supervisors, Danica Van Prusy here at SMU and also Lisa Kelman at St. FX, so thank you.